Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Aircraft carriers are a great way to project your sovereignty beyond your national boundaries. They're like floating military bases and they can deliver all sorts of fun ordinances against your hated enemies. But what if we made aircraft carriers fly, just like those monstrous shield helicarriers we see in the Marvel movies? Is this a feasible design that we can actually recreate with our current technology and material science? Is it even something we'd want to build? Well, that's what we're going to take a look at today. The shield helicarrier is not as random as it might seem. There actually is some historical precedence when it comes to a flying aircraft carrier, so let's take a look at some of those historical designs before we continue on to the helicarrier. Just a few years after the first seaplane took off from the deck of a modified maintenance ship, pilots began experimenting with attaching aircraft to rigid airships. This eventually led to the Akron-class airship, which was built for the U.S. Navy for scouting duties. The Akron-class was around 239 meters in length and could carry and launch planes from a trapeze recovery system. These planes could also be stored inside internal hangars. The designers of the Akron-class airship learned some pretty quick lessons. One was that airships are inherently very dangerous. The USS Akron was caught in a thunderstorm off the coast of New Jersey and 73 of 75 crew members on board were killed. One thing the designers of this airship learned was that an aircraft carrier that flies does not need a flight deck. I mean, think about it. The reason why waterborne carriers need a flight deck is because the planes start off at sea level and need to build up enough speed on the runway so they can generate enough lift to get airborne. But if you are in midair, you can just allow gravity to help you pick up enough speed so that you can start flying. Now, obviously, that's easier to do with a wooden cloth monoplane than it is with a 20-ton F-22 Raptor. But either way, I don't really think the flight deck that we see on the helicarrier is actually necessary. I also imagine trying to fly with a gigantic rectangular ship flight deck will really limit your uh, craft's aerodynamic qualities. So the trapeze tether system, or some kind of alternative method, could be just as effective and as quick at launching and recovering ships while saving a considerable amount of space. Another historical example of an airborne aircraft carrier involved a Boeing 747, which carried microjet fighters internally. It was considered technically feasible by the DoD in 1973, but it wasn't the most practical or cost-efficient design, so it ended up being scrapped. One of the major problems was probably trying to land inside of a moving 747. It doesn't seem very safe or easy, especially when you consider how violent a 747's wake turbulence can be. Something we'll actually have to consider also with the helicarriers later on. An earlier attempt to convert a Convair B-36 Peacemaker into an airborne aircraft carrier was a lot less ambitious and features external mounts on the wings and a trapeze tether system similar to the one we mentioned before. Unlike the Boeing concept, they actually managed to test some of these prototype models, and it did work, although several of the parasite fighters, as they were called, were damaged when attempting to land. It was just too difficult for the average pilot to pull off. Then there was an even earlier attempt to try to build an aircraft carrier that can fly, and that was done with a B-29 bomber, which had wingtip tether points. While a lot of these methods actually proved to be technically possible, uh, from a strategic, economic, and political standpoint, they just were not possible. And also, a lot of these ships had really complicated landing procedures and takeoff procedures, which were just too complicated for your average pilot. Some of these ships also became aerodynamically uh, unsafe, when they had planes attached to the outside of their fuselage. The problem with landing on a fixed wing aircraft while it's flying is that a fixed wing aircraft has to generate enough speed in order to generate enough lift to continue flying. This means that these mid-air approaches have to be very carefully calculated. Now, mid-air refueling is kind of the same concept, but the tether in this case is much further away from the refueling ship. The tether also extends below a tanker aircraft's wake turbulence. Now, a helicarrier would have to approach this landing situation a lot more differently. Helicopters are VTOL, which means they're capable in vertical takeoff and landing. Unlike airplanes that glide and use aerodynamics to stay afloat, helicopters just kind of push themselves through the air with these massive rotors. This is a huge liability when a helicopter loses power. I mean, just Google uh, auto rotation drills for new pilots and you'll see what I mean. It's terrifying. There is some benefits with VTOL craft, though. They can actually hover in mid-air, making them a more stationary platform, or at least allow this aircraft to fly at a much slower speed than a fixed wing craft. 
course, when a normal jet lands on a normal aircraft carrier, the ship is still moving in the ocean. Sometimes it's even easier to land when the carrier is moving at full speed. It can increase the length of the runway by decreasing the pilot's speed in relation to the carrier. A helicarrier would be able to maintain a much slower speed without stalling out when compared to a fixed wing aircraft. It would also make a more stable platform and make the landing procedure easier. And because helicarrier engines are oriented vertically, there's no wake turbulence behind the helicarrier that the pilots have to worry about while approaching the ship. But the rotor wash turbulence below and above this thing is going to be massive. I mean, the rotors on this helicarrier are larger than anything we have here on Earth, and definitely physically longer than most of the fighters on board the helicarrier. If any of the fighters get caught in that rotor wash, you can expect a terrible accident. Now, the helicarrier actually has what's called an angled runway. By angling the flight deck, not only do you get additional length, you can also section off your flight deck into two areas, a takeoff portion, usually equipped with a catapult or a ski jump, and your landing portion, which is a bit longer and at the rear. Now, both decks on the helicarrier seem to be prepped for takeoff and landing, but there's a clear problem with this design. The rear runway takes off straight into one of the rotors. Now, I'm not an engineer, so I probably shouldn't be explaining this to you, but Hey, what the heck. The rotor works kind of like an airplane wing. As it spins around, it generates lift by creating an imbalance in air pressure above and below the rotor, which creates a vacuum force downwards. So not only is the second runway going to send every pilot to their deaths, it's also going to cause one of the engines to explode as a result. This is what you call form over function. You basically had some creative director who said, hey, we want to make the Nimitz into a flying helicopter helicarrier thing. And to be fair, it looks awesome, but it clearly would never work. And while on the matter of those rotors, the helicarrier's rotors are actually way too small for the ship to actually fly. The guys over at Wired did some mathematical wizardry and came to a conclusion that in order to generate enough thrust to fly an aircraft carrier this size, you would have to have rotors roughly around this size. Which makes sense because proportionally speaking, the rotors on the helicarrier are far smaller than anything we ever see on a helicopter. As a matter of fact, I've never seen a helicopter which was bigger than its rotor blades. We're not even sure if it's possible to create a rotor this large. I mean, creating the rotors on a helicopter is one of the most complicated parts of the design process and includes a lot of advanced material science. And, uh, you know, to upscale this design to that size, we might not have the capability right now. Rotor-powered aircraft also have performance limitations compared to fixed-wing aircraft. They're nowhere near as fast and usually have a shorter range and lower max operating altitude. It's probably also not a great idea to have an external flight deck when you're on a flying helicarrier. For one, when you're at higher altitudes, your entire crew will run out of oxygen, so they'll need oxygen masks. Also, if there is some turbulence, what's going to stop your billion dollar fighters from falling over the edge? And we're just at the beginning of the list of the many different problems you'll encounter when you try to create a flying helicarrier. For instance, the traditional aircraft carrier body style does look awesome, but naval ships are built with completely different design principles from aircraft. Naval ship engineers don't have to worry about making their products fly. Therefore, uh, limiting the weight of their vessels is not as important as it would be for an aircraft engineer. So if we are gonna make an aircraft carrier in real life that can fly, we wouldn't try to convert a 100,000 ton warship into a flying machine. We would start from scratch with something that is designed to fly and made from lighter materials. And it's most likely gonna look like a giant plane or maybe even a blimp before it looks like a giant helicopter because of the limitations of that method of propulsion. But then again, every propulsion system we have now is pretty limited compared to whatever's lifting the helicarrier into the air. Apparently, Tony Stark lended some of his repulsor technology to S.H.I.E.L.D. But we might never need to invent a new form of propulsion to actually create a helicarrier, and that's because there's a big shift from manned aircraft to drones. Without a human pilot, all of a sudden, an aircraft becomes much more manageable in terms of size and weight. So it's going to be a lot easier to design a flying drone carrier rather than a flying aircraft carrier that actually sends off little jets with humans inside of it. So if you were looking forward to the helicarrier, I'm sorry, we're probably not going to see one anytime soon. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.